The following program was provided by an independent producer solely responsible for its content. The opinions expressed do not necessarily represent the views of this station, its staff, board of directors, or underwriters. My name is Jasmine, and I am a recovering drug addict. My name is Richie Farrell, a.k.a. The Old White Junkie. And we are your hosts for Exit Team Nashua. Our mission is to bring recovery into the living room. Last year, over 72,000 Americans died of an accidental overdose. That's almost 200 Americans every single day. We will bring you guests with real life experiences with addiction and recovery. Welcome, Welcome to, to Exit, Exit Team, Team Nashua. Nashua. Hi, welcome to Exit Team. My name is Jasmine, and I am your host. Uh, as always, it's a pleasure being here with you. Thank you for tuning in. Uh, Exit Team is a show that takes people who have experiences with addiction, alcoholism, any kind of life trauma, uh, and we bring them on the show to share their experience, strength, and hope, or people that also have like resources available, uh, because there is an endless amount of resources available out there for people. People need to know how to access them, how to utilize them. Uh, so if you or a loved one are watching the show tonight and you have any questions or anyone, someone in your life suffering, you need resources or you need anything, feel free to send us a message on uh, our Facebook page. Uh, and if you haven't checked us out already on Facebook, please do now. Go give us a like. It is I am a heroin addict. Um, and so I'm excited for tonight's show. I have this handsome man over here. Hi, what's your name? My name is Derek Lawson. Der Derek Lawson, are you yeah. from the cell? I am, I am. <laughs> you are? Where are you from? <laughs> I'm from about 45 minutes northwest of Charlottesville, Virginia. Okay, that means nothing to me. I have no idea. Uh, <laughs> That's okay. So it's very close to the West Virginia state line. Okay. It's all mountain country, right outside the Shenandoah Valley. That sounds beautiful. It is. It's oh. gorgeous. Okay. Why are you on the show tonight? Uh, well, my experience with drug addiction and alcoholism. You don't look like a drug addict. Uh, I'm a talk in a sub uh, draw too. <laughs> I look a lot better than I used to. You know? um, <laughs> Prove it. Where's the before picture? <laughs> All right. You want to see it? Because no, I definitely have it. You can't see it on the camera. That's what but... I figured. So, um, no, my experience with drug addiction and alcoholism has become quite a wonderful experience now mm -hmm. you know it wasn't a good experience for a good portion of my life um it was a good experience probably the first five years or so you know okay. and then it went south okay no pun intended okay um, <laughs> i didn't until you said it and then when you said it, i was like that was good actually <laughs> oh <laughs> okay so so you how old were you let's like screw back it up um how old were you uh well my first started. my first drink was i was about 11 about 11, 12. 11 years, your first alcoholic beverage? Yep. Okay, is that common down south? Uh, so, so. Uh, I grew up moonshine culture, so okay. it's very normal to be. That is very different than our culture here? Yes. Okay. Very different. Uh, two totally different worlds. Moonshine. You, you know, yeah. it doesn't even. I grew up heroin culture. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> I grew up in heroin culture. <laughs> okay. That's great. Um, so it's very common. I mean, even in country and rural society i mean you listen to country music majority of it's drinking beer and riding around like mm -hmm. it's very normal for My us to drink all the time hate you know? when i listen to country music they literally really? send me death messages and i usually <laughs> listen to it every morning and i snap them knowing that i'm like getting mm. a rise out of them good mm -hmm. good for you thank you um yeah i mean i would say it was you know pretty normal i mean the experience was that a role model in my life at the time was um i mean still is what am i talking about um at the time, they were drinking 180 proof uh, alcohol, and I wanted to be like them. And they said, if you can drink a whole glass, it'd make you a man. So, of course, down the shoot it goes, and I get violently physically sick, but I got a lot of relief internally in that, you know, because even as a child, I remember being very fear-driven, mm -hmm. you, you know. Um, can, you, for, can you describe what that means, like fear-driven So, as a child? like, when I was, from the time I woke up from the, to the time I went to bed, my mind raced all the time. All the time, constantly thinking about everything involving me, you know, what other kids thought of me when I got alone. I was dominated by the opinion of other people, dominated by it. You know, I'd say whatever lie I had to as a child to try to impress other kids at school. I would do things that I really didn't want to do because I wanted them to think a certain perception of me. And I also let kids in school treat me any way that they wanted to because I wanted to be accepted. Mm -hmm. You know, I would deal with behavior that I shouldn't have, you, you know, um, but kids are kids, you know. 
Um, so <laughs> okay. <laughs> I mean, well, because I'm still harboring resentment from Holly right. from first grade. So. <laughs> but okay, sure, kids are kids. You know, um, kids can be pretty mean. And, yeah. you know, they, they were mean to me in certain rights. And mm -hmm. I was mean to some other kids as I got older, you know, and that wasn't the right way to be about it either, mm -hmm. you know. Um, but I remember the moment that the buzz of that drink hit me, that fear was gone disappeared like a magic trick you know and i loved it because mm -hmm. i felt comfortable mm -hmm. you know um i couldn't feel comfortable no matter what i did you know um and over the course of like the next couple of years i get into pot and oxycontin and benzos and you, you know and it wasn't severe at the time you, you know but at every chance i could get i was going for it you know and as I get a little older, I start, I mean, I was kind of hanging around some older kids anyway. Um, my parents worked a lot as a kid and, you know, I mean, we were, we were pretty poor growing up and, um, but they did the best they could, you know, and we didn't go without for most things, you know? And, um, so as I get older, we realized cause about 13 years old, I hit this growth spurt, you know, and I'm like six one. Now I'm like shaving my face. I'm like in seventh grade and, um, seven or eighth grade and, um, we figured out that I could buy beer without an ID. Ayo. Know? <laughs> Ayo. Uh, exactly. <laughs> Derek become the man quick. Yeah. You know? Now I go up on his pedestal yeah. to the crowd around me, you know, and um, I remember like it escalated like super fast over the course of a few weeks from the time of me being able to buy a beer. I'm now into opiates and benzos and amphetamine salts and um, that kind of stuff. And when I realized you could mix multiple substances, that hung me harder, right? Like I was... I was in the rut quick. And so over the course of the next couple of years, it escalated pretty seriously. And, um, you know, I give away a sports career and, you know, music opportunities and things that it laid before me. And I, I had a, I didn't have a hard time in school. I was very lazy, right? Like I, I could pass a test all the time, but I'm not doing your homework because I'm too good for that. You know, entitlement's been a ruining factor in my life. You know, I've been very entitled for most mm -hmm. of my life as, Probably someone in my position shouldn't be. You know, you would think somebody that, that comes from that kind of environment isn't. But well, as an makes, alcoholic, it's my experience. I was going to say, it makes a lot of sense because, you, you know, know, it's fear-driven. Right. So mm -hmm. now I'm getting to be in my mid-teenage years, and um, I'm going into withdrawal from alcohol and opiates regularly, you know. And I didn't know what was happening. I didn't realize that that was a thing, you know. Like... I'd stop drinking and I'd start shaking like a leaf. And I knew if I drank, the shaking stopped. That's all I knew. And I wasn't going to ask any questions about it, you know, because where I'm from, drug addiction and alcoholism is viewed as a moral problem, you, you know. And for someone like me, that that's not my experience. You, you know, um, my morality had nothing to do with it. And so <laughs> I remember trying to stop for the first time at 18. And I basically ruined Thanksgiving dinner. Um, <laughs> at my grandmother's house and um because i'm just obviously like in full withdrawal I'm, like my skin's bleat red i'm extremely like swollen up i can't hardly function and speak and um I, it's clear i'm having a very difficult time just to sit here and eat dinner you know and uh i remember like the pain that my face felt when it like touched a silk pillow how sensitive i was and uh i get up my grandmother goes boy you smell like a distillery you know and it's like for i guess that was like the first time that like something clicked you, you know um and my grandfather was uh was a moonshiner growing up and then he became a pentecostal preacher like in my lifetime and he, you know and he's a phenomenal man today and um a great role model and it was very interesting because where i'm from it's obviously it's appalachian blue ridge mountain country and it's the tip of the bible belt you, you know and um, christianity is the only way out of anything for a lot of the moral issues yet you, you know there's not really any resources for a lot of stuff i mean it's better now than it was you know but growing up that was kind of the view and if you were a drug addict you were kind of cast aside exiled in a sense you know and it's like two communities that live there that really don't have anything to do with the other you, you know and one doesn't recognize the other one is a major problem up until like the last few years you know with the opiate epidemic and bodies dropping now it's not deniable anymore you, you know we can't just sweep this under the rug we can't just run the meth addicts out of town and they go running the sticks and do what they do you know and um so i graduate high school by the the skin of my backside you know and i uh, get out and i'm working for my granddaddy's excavation and logging business because i knew they wouldn't piss test me and i knew that you know i could make some decent money and um still pay for the beer and all the stuff you know and 
Now, I'm getting to a point where I've been seeing this girl and me and her moving together, you know, right out of high school and get our own place. And um, it's clearly become a problem, right? Because up until like through my earlier teenage years, I was a good time, Charlie. Everybody loved <laughs> to have me around. I was a good time. You know, I got booze and drugs and, you know, let's go. Everything's great, you know. And then um, somewhere about 17 years old, I had a profound personality change and I become very mean, abusive, toxic, controlling. I was not a fun individual anymore, you know, um, violent by nature, just not, not a lovely creature. And so as I, <clears throat> as that began, I started to try to find ways of management, right? Not because I wanted to find management because the people in my life were tired of dealing with me, you know, and I was extremely resentful because, you know, now that I was hateful and hard to deal with, now I have a problem. And I felt like I had a problem before I was hateful. You know, internally, I knew something wasn't right, you know, but I couldn't admit that it could not drink or use drugs in safety. I had a really hard time with that, like most do, right? <clears throat> I'm not unique in that. And uh, I mean, what 18-year-old kid wants to think that he can't do drugs and get high or drink or go out with their friends and do what their friends are doing, you know? And But it was pretty obscene, you, you know, like we were discussing sobriety in my house at 15, you, you know, and I grew up moonshine culture. They talk to you about a drinking problem. It ain't good. <laughs> you know, like, this is not a good thing. And, yeah. like, I'm using the mouthwash trick. I'm stashing bottles under the bed. Mm -hmm. I'm drinking myself to sleep at night. I can't, I'm not even having a driver's license yet. You know what I mean? And it's like, none of this registered to me as a problem whatsoever. Nowhere at any point. And um, so I start trying these different forms of management. And I'm like, well, I can't drink beer because I drink too much of it, so now I'm going to drink liquor, because it'll take less. And now I drink more liquor. And well, like, all right, well, I can't do hard drugs, so I'm going to do light drugs. And I'll just, like, smoke pot and maybe do pills every now and again. And I try that, and that doesn't work out. I always end up back in, like, these same shoes, just obliterated drunk or high out of my mind, wreaking havoc in everybody else's lives. And um, so uh, I get into my 20s, and I'm freshly married, with the woman who loved me to pieces, you know, and, and treated me to the best of her ability, stood by through all my verbal and emotional abuse and the trauma of, like, who I was as a person, right? Because, like, most people, you, you know, my guess is if they tell you they were in the end of me getting high, I was, I was a tornado in your life, you, you know? And um, so <laughs> I'd just gotten married. I'd actually lost a bunch of weight healthily, right? I looked like I was on drugs, but I wasn't on drugs. You know, everybody thought I was on drugs, and I'm like, no, oh, I'm actually not on drugs. I'm just drinking. And then um, a few months after that, I, I got into crystal meth, and my whole world turned upside down, you know, because for the last few years of drinking and getting high, I didn't get any relief from it. Yeah. It, you know, mm -hmm. there, there was no relief anymore. Yeah. That condition was just as lively as it was sober, you, mm -hmm. you know, and I was extremely hopeless, to be honest with you. You know, I was married. I had a home, had a few vehicles, you know, I had materially, my life was grand, you know, like I didn't really have to do a whole lot. Mm -hmm. And if I ever wanted to, you, you know, everything's pretty much said. And I was absolutely miserable. I had no will to live whatsoever, you, you know, and I got into crystal meth and it, that relief came back, you, you know, and I had a, a individual close to my family who, who did a long time in prison for manufacturing and distribution and you know like I grew up around all these things I've seen the consequences of all these things but for someone like me they're irrelevant mm -hmm. doesn't matter consequence don't play a role over here but the emotional appeal <laughs> yeah what mm -hmm. people say to me and what people feel for me and what I say to them and what I feel for them it's not enough like, <laughs> it's not enough no. it doesn't even hold a candle and it's not yeah. their fault you know <laughs> that's that's one of the biggest things I like to push to people who aren't in recovery or like love someone in recovery like realize it ain't got nothing to do with you mm -hmm. you, you know don't take it personal because it it's not it ain't about you in that yeah. right you know like you didn't cause this you, you know what I mean like um like I know my parents probably still have a hard time with it thinking it was their fault it, and it wasn't their fault you know there was nobody on earth that was going to change the decisions I was making you, you know I yeah was and caught we, are, we are willful and we are determined right. and yeah 100 well, percent you, you know my experience with that allergic reaction and that phenomenon of craving, when it dominates me, baby, everything else is out to window. <laughs> yeah. It's out of question, you, <laughs> yeah. you know, mm -hmm. and I don't care what has I to happen know. in between, you, you know, <laughs> so it's like, so then I get into crystal meth, you know, and then six months later, I'm on the way to treatment for the first time, you know, and uh, looking like Joe Dirt, right? Like, <laughs> exactly, I want to see that photo. Horrible, horrible, <laughs> you, you know, um, it, like my skin smelled like lithium. 
<laughs> you, you know, from all the battery acid. And it, it, like, it was just nasty, you know, and mm-hmm. I was absolutely hopeless. And I remember my cousin, he told me, he's like, Derek, you're going to die. That's what's going to happen here. He's like, yeah, but I can't stop, dude. I cannot quit. I don't know what else to do. I don't want to get high anymore, but I can't quit. Yeah. And he saw it right there, you know, like, all right, let's try to get you in somewhere. You know, I know a place down in southwest Virginia and we'll, we'll get you set up, you know, and thank God for insurance because if I wouldn't have insurance, I would, you know, I'd probably be smoked today. And um, as uh, you get ready to go to treatment, like the perspective at the time was, I remember like telling my family, you know, that I'm going to treatment and my dad says, do you think a vacation is going to fix this? I'm like, woof dude you know like and which is probably fair because all the times i had lied and manipulated you, you know like it was fair for him not to trust what i was saying you know in my attempt to do so and you know he actually ended up offering he's like listen if you're serious like i'll take you mm-hmm. you, you know which was cool um so then i go to treatment for the first time and um i had this experience with 12-step fellowships and like all of this like this whole experience of recovery that i had never heard of before right because like where i'm from like aa was not recommended right because it's requiters nobody gets sober and um i had no experience before then and i was so in denial and indifference to substances that i refused to go to one over the other because of the title right like we're not talking about that i got a drug problem right that's my issue here not derek derek's not a problem here yeah. right so um i get out and i go there and i show up i i take the suggestions that were given to me um outside of a program to work and um i hadn't heard much of any of that and i keep going i keep just fighting out because sobriety's supposed to be this boxing ring you know i just keep swinging and everything's gonna be all right well i fight i lose that was my experience you, you know and yeah, six weeks later, I'm in a hospital, overdosed. You, you know, um, on my mother's birthday, I was fixing to move to North Carolina. I had like this bright outlook in my mind, right? And um, so I wake up in this hospital. I'm like, whoa, dude, this is not where I wanted to go. You know, um, I just wanted one drink prior to this visit. If you'd put me on a polygraph, it'd have been true. You, you know, I had no intention of anything that happened after that. And um, so then I think long term treatment's going to fix it. You know, and so then I go to long-term treatment, and I go out to Grand Rapids, Michigan, for a while, and I ended up in a pretty wild place out there, and um, <laughs> it didn't pan out well either. <laughs> you, you know, and the whole time I'm in there, I'm just uh, I'm obsessing over the drink. Like I cannot wait to get out of here. Like, I need a drink. You know, I'm just irritable, restless, discontent. I'm so uncomfortable in sobriety, and I'm not one of these individuals that like could ever put any time together. You know, like if I put six months of sobriety together in ten years. Or getting high and drinking, I'd be lucky, you, you know. And that was only because I couldn't get my hands on it, or I couldn't cheat it, or cop it, or whatever. You know what I mean? Whatever the case was, like I just physically could not get my hands on it. Is the only reason I had that, you know. And so then I come home, and um, a very unfortunate series of events starts to unfold. You, you know, and um, like terrible relationships and it was abusive relationships on both parties. And um, I'm out here running the streets, making money that way, and. You, you know, um, I get in this position where I caught one charge and then I couldn't get a job because that was pending on the, the background check. So anywhere I applied to, it was like, no way, dude, not doing that, you know? So it's like, um, of course, um, I remember I had moved back home with my folks and my folks did every way that they knew how to help me, you, you know? Um, and my dad said, listen, I know what you're doing. And if you're doing it now, don't come home this evening. If you're not, then you can come home. And it was like, all right, Dad, I hear you. And I, I was high in that moment, you know. It's like, yeah, I'm not going home this evening. So then I was kind of like in and out of my car and Motel 6s and, you, you know, got caught up in a bunch of legal trouble. And um, I ended up catching a gun charge. And thank God I did. Mm-hmm. You, you know, thank God it, that they ha- things happened the way that they did, you know. And, and um, so here I am. I found out you could go back to treatment on probation. You, you know, I had no idea. You know, I felt like I was very misinformed <laughs> in a lot of these things. Um, and I had to learn them the hard way, unfortunately. But um, so I was like, all right, well, I'll tell her I'm going to go back for drinking. I can't tell her I go on drugs because they'll lock me up, you, you know, because um, they're very much still the guillotine style way of treatment as far as drug addiction goes. Um, they're making progress, but some of it's still pretty ancient. And um, the views of mental health and things of that sort is the same way. And so... Now, I go back to treatment, and I got sober September 16, 2016. Um, my birthday September 23rd. 
they had put my sentencing date for this charge on my birthday, right? And it was a, supposed to be a two to four year minimum. And I wake up in this treatment center bed and I'm like, buddy, this ain't working. What you're doing right now is failing you utterly. Everything you have done has failed you utterly. You, you know, um, you're 22, you're divorced, you've had two children pass away, you've been in and out of your vehicle and motels for almost the last year, nine months, and you're going to prison for the next four years. This is not good, but you're not going to make it to 30. It's not going to happen. So you better figure it out, you know. So I immediately just tried to do the next right thing in my mind, you, you know, because I was raised with decent morals, you know, and um, like I said, my parents did the best they could. Um, a lot of my stuff come from insecurity and, and some things I'd seen in life, you know. But anyway, I get on the phone and this guy says, listen, man, like I might know there's a solution for you. And he sends me to a place in Quincy and I go through there and I go through the steps in a very rapid process very quickly you know and thank god i did me too because it saved my life if yeah. i wouldn't have went through those steps in a rapid thorough process i'd have been in trouble mm -hmm. you, you know and my life today is pretty grand in comparison mm -hmm. overall like I, I mean even when things are hard and difficult like it really doesn't matter you know might freak out for a little bit but, yeah but it's all right you, yeah you know that appreciation for duality yeah has really come, you know, the tide goes in and it must come out, Yeah, you, you know, so it's a beautiful We learn to experience. ride the waves. That's it. Yeah. Just surfing out here. You, <laughs> yeah. you know, that's it. Yeah. It, and that these experiences are necessary and vital, mm -hmm. right? They're, I mean, don't get me wrong, like some things are bad, right? There are horrible times to experience, right? But it's not personal. I think that was one of the hardest things that I had to let go of was learning that life wasn't personal. Yeah. And even when it's horrible, it's, it's it's not horrible. Like right. there is something coming on the other side That's of it. it, you know, no matter what it is, you know, uh, I've, uh, you know, lost loved ones, mm. you know, like going, going through my sobriety and like they no longer suffer, you know, like mm. they no longer suffer. So and people will right. be like, well, like, how can you justify or rationalize death? And it's like, well, that person no longer suffers. Like right. they're okay. They've made their way to peace. So That's right. there's always something on the other side of it. So what are like, we, our show is almost over. What are um like what are some things that really helped you in early recovery? <sighs> things that really helped me. Yeah. Um, prayer, meditation, the mm -hmm. spiritual route is what worked for me. Um, there's a hundred other ways to do this. It's not just one way, um, but it is the only way that worked for me. You, yeah. you know, um, prayer, meditation, the attempt to eat right, go to the gym. You, you Treat know, the and, whole person. Yeah, the whole nine. Self love. Because I beat yeah. my body to pieces through the years. Yeah. You, you know and. Mm -hmm. If I wouldn't have been, and staying busy, right? Like I, I'm a type of individual, I'm high gear. I go, 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 go. I need to be busy. You know, I don't do well with a bunch of idle time. Mm -hmm. Even my self-care, if it's resting, like I'm, I'm doing something, you, you know? Um, and like my early sobriety was pretty pretty crazy you, you know like it was, it was, oh lord it was, you know do like, i know i'm like on trial like awaiting this time and like working steps and going to the gym and like making all this new associations i'm, like, I'm from a town of like and now it's like ten thousand people it was a lot smaller growing up it's like nine miles outside of it you know what i mean i hear a freight train nine miles out it was more people in logan airport when i landed here than the entire town was I that grew an up anxiety in. attack it was a pretty large adjustment you know because i'm like i'm backwoods boony sticks hit you, you know so it's like it was a whole culture shock, yeah. you know, and adjusting to all that. And you're in the city, too, so. Right, like yeah. right on the South Shore, you know, yeah. like right outside of Boston. So it's like when I remember like coming here and they're like, oh, yeah, 10 minutes, dude, that's a hike. I'm like, what? <laughs> <laughs> it's like 45 minutes to a Walmart. Where I'm from. <laughs> 10 minutes is a hike. All right. Here I guess, you know, and the people and just the whole way of life was very much larger an adjustment, but it was good at the time, you know, that hustle, bustle, let's go, 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 mm -hmm. you, you know, because everybody's busy and moving and yeah. making things happen. So I feel I like... I had to be like very fast paced, uh, early sobriety. I was always just taking more and more and more on my plate. And I'm really grateful for that experience. Right. Uh, and I would be lying to you if I told you that, uh, that I don't still do that. I do. Right. Uh, I think that I have found a way to like slow down and, and you know, make inner peace and connect with self, but uh, I'm still very much very busy all the time and a go-getter. And even wow. when I have idle time on my hands, um, you know, I try and force myself to just sit and be with self. But like, for instance, yesterday, like I was sitting at my house and I was like, didn't know what to do with myself. So I called my tattoo artist and uh, he didn't have availability. And then I like went and bought a snake. And, so, <laughs> and now I'm a proud snake mom. Um, but yeah, I like, I get the uh, staying busy 
too. What what else like worked for you? Fellowship, like this fellowship. I mean, I was in a lot of meetings, you know, but uh, I don't know. My mind was so so much madness. I was probably in there just spewing a bunch of trash, <laughs> you know, like nothing that was like. Because sometimes, uh, like with almost three years, the stuff that comes out of your mouth is still alarming. So <laughs> right. Like, I couldn't imagine. I like Facebook memories when I'm scrolling through them, and it's like early recovery. My heart like sinks. I'm like, oh god, I'm cringing. I can't believe I did that. I'm cringing. Oh, and, this is horrible. And like, what was objectionable to me back then is like. Right. It's like it's something I would never even think of doing today. It's crazy. I feel like something that I haven't let go of and maybe it was like the guiding force at the time, right, was that like do or die mentality. You, okay. You know, either like I do this well, yeah. or it's over, baby. Mm -hmm. I'm out. You, you know what I mean? Like yep. I've treated it like it was my last chance. I still do. You, you know, and I'm the same way. Like mm -hmm. I'm, it's do or die out here for me. And, you, you know, like when I was in early sobriety, I was like working steps. It was an IOP going to three That's four just our sickness, week. Like, though. Just like, like we're just manifesting in other ways. I do right. it at work. I'm like such a good worker. <laughs> it's like, yeah, because I have horrible boundaries and like I treat the isms <laughs> with work. And I'm like, everything's great, dude. Worked 70 hours this week. Da, 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 da. And like every right. other of my life is not well balanced. But work is on point. Point. Right. Yeah. I treat the isms with <laughs> all kinds of things. Right. So. I feel like the biggest factor for me that was extremely helpful were the men that like surrounded, not necessarily surrounded me, but that kind of helped bring me through the process. You know, okay. and it helped educate me in the process yep. because they lived it to the letter, you know, and yep. they knew what they were talking about. Yeah. Yeah, you know, so it was well, that, that's that's the thing. Like, if, if you're going to choose the spiritual way of, or if you, I shouldn't even say choose because, like, I didn't choose this. Right. <laughs> I, I did not choose to live the spiritual way. Okay, it chose me, but it's not about like what I say, it's about what I do. Right. You know, and if my words don't match my actions, my experience shows that I relapse. Right. You know, and, and for someone like me, that doesn't end well and right. it, it goes south real quick. So, cut you off. What were you saying? Uh, no, um, that, that was a big. Big piece for me because I felt totally new, right? Like totally new the entire idea, you know, like I had a really like self bound. Um, and when I say that, I mean like negative perspective on fellowships and recovery in general, because I'm like, man, these people are miserable. I don't want to do this. Like they've been recovering for 30 years. I'm like, <laughs> oh my God, this is brutal. You know, like I hated every second of it, you know? And That's so great. I heard a guy say, you know, my name is so-and-so and I'm a recovered alcoholic. Tonight we're talking about alcoholism and I'm like, all right. Here yeah. we go, you know? Like, now I hear hope because somebody reached a place that somebody else has been trying to get for 30 years. You know what I mean? And, like, there's nothing wrong with that. It was just that was my experience. You know, yeah. that's the way I felt. So I had a really I had a really good time with the guys that, that brought me through, and that was really important. The show's me. over. Wow. Yeah, I know. Uh, if you're watching, thank you for watching. If you have questions for Derek, look him up on Facebook. It is what? Your Facebook name? Oh, Derek Lawson. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was like, it was not what? a trick question. Uh, <laughs> thank you for watching. Please reach out to myself or Derek if you need any help or you have any questions. And Derek, thank you for coming on. Thank you guys for having me. Yes. The preceding program was provided by an independent producer solely responsible for its content. The opinions expressed do not necessarily represent the views of this station, its staff, board of directors, or underwriters.